Hello and welcome to One on One on Plus TV Africa. Here with me is Margaret Kush, the co-founder of Kush Home Stores in South Africa, to speak on building a sustainable business. Thank you for joining me on the program. Thank you for inviting me. You moved from being laid off yes. to becoming a business tycoon in South Africa. Tell me about it. Well, when I got pregnant um, and I've been married for five years, my boss just said to me, you're fired. So I was fired that day. I took my handbag home. And you know, as a pregnant woman, especially when you've been waiting a long time for this baby, and you think, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? How am I going to feed myself? Never mind anybody else. So it's, it's, it, was a, it was a big shock because I never thought it was going to happen. But you know, it was the best thing he ever did to me because if he hadn't have done that, I would have been working for a boss till today. Because he did that, and I always, my saying is, you can work for a boss and make a living, you work for yourself and make a fortune. And that's basically what people do. They leave working in corporate, they start working for themselves, and they start making a fortune. And it's just amazing. So he did me the biggest favor. I didn't think so at the time. But he did me a big favor. So you moved from having one store to 22 all across South Africa. How did this happen? It took a long time and a lot of hard work. But you know, I think it sort of evolves. It doesn't just happen. We didn't say we're going to get, get 22 stores. And we actually got, uh, are looking at building another one this year. So we try and build one or two a year. We've been in business for 40 years. So it, was, it works out averaging just over two a year. And we built one, and, we, and then we built the next one, and then we built the next one. So it goes very slowly, because you've got to get your staff trained, you've got to get the capital. Because I don't believe in borrowing money. It says in the Bible, never a borrow or lend a be. So we, we try not to borrow money. We borrow money to buy our properties, and we pay them off as quick as we can. Tell me, how were you able to start this journey? Did you attend a business school? No, it was, you know, I started work when I was 12 years old washing hair in the hairdressing salon because we were very poor people. I come from a very poor family. So um, in our day, in my matric year, we were 12 girls. Eight got married the first year out of school because in those days, if you were poor, they, you, they married you off so they didn't have to feed you. So I actually got engaged the first year out of school and I was going to be married. And then one day I woke That's up and said, oh my goodness, I was 17. In those days, you, got, you did get married a lot earlier than today. And um, so I went overseas at age 18 and I worked in London and to find out what the world was all about. Then I came back and the year I came back I met my husband and I was only 20. Now in South Africa you can't get married unless you're 21 and, or unless your parents sign for you. So because mine was a cross-cultural marriage my parents wouldn't sign and his parents sent him to Israel to go and find a, a wife of his religion. So it was very difficult but he, thank goodness he came back and then as soon as I turned 21 we got married. You both started a large business in South Africa together. Did you have any formal educational background? No, when I, when I married my husband, he was 24, he could neither read nor write. He'd never ever passed um, any high school standards. And I just got a basic South African matric. So we had no massive degrees or anything behind us. And, and as I said, we came from very ordinary people who, I mean, in our house, to go to university wasn't even con consideration. Nobody thought about it. So we just came and we worked our way up. But we knew what we wanted. And I think that's important enough. You've got to know what you want. Now, we didn't think we'd have a huge business. We just started a small business because we had to put food on the table and put roof over our head. So we started a small business, but what we did in our formula, which works, which I've done a million times now, is to plow that money you make back into the business, back into the business, until you make it strong. You know, when we first started our business, another business exactly the same started in the same road, in fact, about three doors down. And the, the chap who owned it was called Billy Healy, and we saw him within three months with a brand new motor car, and six months later, he had a boat behind his car, and we were working, he was going to the dam, I'm going away for the weekend, and we thought, what are we doing wrong? Wrong. But he equated profit to turnover or turnover to profit. So he thought that when he made money, he could spend it. But he didn't realize when you make money, you've got to plow it back in. And that's what I said to you today. Um, it's very important that we teach people how to handle the money. Because a lot of people know how to make money. They don't know how to keep money. Making money is easy. Keeping it is the difficult part. So how are you able to spot business opportunities when you, you know, work out? Well, you know, I think th there's so many opportunities out there. You know, God gives you so many opportunities, you just can't believe it. But most people don't take the opportunities. So usually when people come to see me, they've taken the opportunity, they've started a business, and they've decided what they want to do with their life. And they just don't know how to do it. So I just fine-tune them and teach them how to get it get it right because it's very straightforward you've got to you in the service industry no matter what you're doing you've got to look after your customers you have to buy it sell it then pay for it so it's a very simple formula that we follow 
and it really, really works. But as I say to people, I teach ladies how to bake, and I say, this is how you make a cake. You cream the butter and the sugar, you add the eggs, you add the flour, you put it in the oven, you get a cake. That's the formula. Now, sometimes they'll think, no, I'm going to shortchange that formula, and they'll take the eggs out. It doesn't work. And it's the same with the formula that I teach. If you stick to the formula, it works incredibly well. It's 100% foolproof. But you can't change that formula, else it doesn't work. All right, so in terms of business and managing business, because obviously you have done incredibly well with Hush, right? What model do you work with? Well, first of all, you've got to be extremely honest. Secondly, you have to have integrity, and integrity is doing what you say you're going to do. And thirdly, you've got to be very loyal. We're very loyal to our suppliers. They're very loyal to us. So those are our three criteria for having a good business. Um, apart from that, it's just when you make the money to plow it back into the business all the time. And to not change your lifestyle. As soon as people start say, making money, they start living in extravagant homes, they start driving big cars, they start you know, spending and showing off. That's not what it's about. It's about sustaining it. You want to sustain it, which you means you've got to keep it going. And for me, the, my greatest joy in my life was when my son came to help me to run the business. My son, the reason I can be here today is my son is running the business because a business, our business runs seven days a week, 363 days a year. So thank you, Lord, that he is there and running that business for me so that I can be here helping other women to know what they can do. Now here I hear you talk about the second year, you're building a second generation company already. Yes. Do you foresee this happening? You know, I didn't. I must say that I sent both my children overseas to go and, and find out what they wanted for their lives. And thank you, Lord, they both came back and they both joined the business. I've now got five grandsons, so I'm really hoping that one or two of them will come into the business so we can take it to the third generation. Because usually in family businesses, it's the third generation usually messes it up and loses everything. So, but we're teaching those boys really good values and we're educating them well so that they can come into our business and make it go from strength to strength. In terms of when third generation, you know, the third generation starts to fail, yes. where would you say they get it wrong, basically? I think they're too spoiled. You know, I'm also lucky because uh, we had a couple who had a business very similar to ours in South Africa, and I watched what they did, and they're 10 years older than us. And I saw what they did right and also what they did wrong. So I made my children come into the business, and well, as I make them, they came into the business, but I made them work hard. They worked just as hard, if not harder, than the, any other employee. They also started at the bottom. My son started um, driving a van, you know, picking up spares. He did every part of that business. My daughter started as my PA, so that she learned the business that way. So I, I made them work really, really hard. And so that they would understand the business and they would understand what it is to be an employee. And then now that they're the employer, they will treat the employees really well. Because you've got to treat your employees well if you want them to treat your customers well. I know that you did mention that some of your employees have worked for decades. Yes. When you say treat your employees well, what are those benefits that you give to your employees that you feel other institutions do not give their employees? Yeah, I think, well, basically, I know everybody's name. I know who they're married to, where they live, every, and we have a big staff. We have over 2,000 staff, so I know them all. I know where they come from. I know what they do. Um, I think it's different because we're more like a family. Because it's a family business, the whole place is more like a family, so we work very closely together. If they have problems, we help them over their problems. We help them. I'm just helping one of my girls through a divorce now, um, you know, and she's got the child she's got to look after. So we help them in that way. We help them with their school fees if they can't, you know, um, afford the school fees. We have obviously pension and medical benefits. We make sure they all have medical benefits so that they're well looked after. So I think we basically just make sure that it's a happy place to work. You know, every morning we sing our national anthem when we come in the morning and we have a motivational talk. They all motivate each other. We sing a song, you know, something like um, S Type 7, Reach for the Stars, you know, things like that, so that they, they feel motivated to, for the day and they can leave their troubles from home behind and come and start fresh when they come to work. So how are you able to manage and sustain your business? Well, it's, I work very hard. I work 20 hours a day, seven days a week. I live um, in Joburg. I work Monday, Tuesday, Joburg, Wednesday, Thursday, Cape Town, Friday, Saturday, Durban. And one week and Sunday on my farm, I, have five, I run five homes. So, um, and then one week of the month I'm out the country. Last month I was in Tanzania, um, and I'm in Nigeria. Next month I'm in the UK, then the month after I'm in the USA. And so I just go, in fact, in April I'm in Panama, I'm going to Panama. So I travel one week of the month, and then three weeks I work really hard. Okay, we'll take a quick break now. You're still watching One on One on Plus TV Africa. Stay tuned, guys.
Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching One on One on Plus TV Africa. How are you able to manage your finances in Hosh? Well, it's very simple. If you've got money, you spend it, and if you haven't, you don't. So, um, you know, I remember I spoke at a conference of CAs, who's chartered accountants, and they said to me, how many CAs do you employ? So I said, none. And they said, why not? So I said, because I don't need to pay somebody to tell me how to handle my money. If I can't handle my money, I don't deserve it. I'm a great believer that God gives you a little bit of money, and he sees how you handle it. If you handle it well and you make it grow, he gives you more. But if you don't and you waste it, then he doesn't give you any more. If you gave me your last hundred, whatever the money is here, um, and I tore it up and I put my hand out for more, what would you say to me? You'd say, I'm not going to give you any more. And God's exactly the same. He sees how you handle your money and he, if you look after it and you make it grow, he gives you more. And that's a simple thing. So that's what we do. And we, we grow our money little by little by little, but we always invest it back into the business, invest it back into the business all the time so that the business is built on a strong foundation. So when there's trouble, like we went through the 2008 recession, our business is strong because we had a strong foundation for it to, to rest on. Yeah. One would listen to you and the success of your business and would think that there are no challenges. You have never faced any challenges. Oh, wow. There are yeah. lots. So I'd like lots. to know, what are those challenges? Well, you know, theft is huge because I sell things that people want. I sell cell phones, I sell sound bars, I sell television sets. So theft is huge. Um, internal, external, we have had massive break-ins. In fact, um, three weeks ago, at night, the burglars came in. They cut into all our they cut the doors off. I mean, it was just amazing. They had massive trucks that they'd hired. They'd loaded over oh two million goodness. rands worth of, of televisions. And, uh, you know, it was just amazing because the armed response, we were actually investigating the building next door, saw them, came in, and we managed to get every single product back. So we've been incredibly lucky like that. So you, there's always challenges. You know, people would say, I want to go into business with you. And um, there was a, a man who, uh, we bought his business, and then he, um, you know, we paid him the money, and then he started up in opposition to us. So yeah, there, be, there always are challenges, but I always say, God puts bumps in the road. And if you get, you've got to get over the bump and carry on. But sometimes you get to the top of the bump and you roll back. And you've just got to keep going until you get over that bump, and then you can carry on to the next one. And there will always be challenges in life. You can't just sit down and die and cry or whatever. You just have to face them head on, be strong and go forward. Let's talk a bit about your corporate social responsibility because you seem extremely engaged in CSR. What's your mindset towards it and what are the things you have also done in this Well, field? you know, I have I run lots of groups for women. So, I, you know, when a woman stay at home and have their babies, they go from a corporate environment where it's busy, busy, busy to suddenly sitting at home with a baby that, you know, you can only talk so much to a baby. So we have our first week of the month, we have groups of, of we call moms and babes, where their moms bring their children, their new babies in, and they get together with other moms who are staying on maternity leave and, and you know, or having their second baby or whatever. So they have a little group to, to belong to. The second week of the month, I have my ladies meeting, which is women who are in business. And you know, sometimes as an entrepreneur, it can be quite lonely up there because you've come from like an ordinary background, you start to build your career, your business starts to build, and you leave some of your friends behind and, you, and the new ones, you don't really know them that well and you don't know if you can trust them. So you're in a bit of an odd space. So I get all entrepreneurs together and we get together and, we, and you know, we all have the same challenges with cash flow and with staff and that type of thing. So we can, we can chat about it. And you know, women like to chat. We like to chat. We like to get it off our chest. We like to tell the whole story. And men are not interested in listening to us. So we listen to each other and we help each other. And, and I always say girls fight, but women support each other. So we support each other. And we help to grow each other's businesses. And then the third week of the month, I teach domestic workers. In South Africa, every household has a domestic worker who does the housework while the lady of the house goes to work. I could not run my business if I didn't have really good domestic workers in my homes. So I take them and we try and upskill them because a lot of them are domestic workers because that was the only job they could get. Inside them is a fabulous person waiting to get out, but she just doesn't know how. So with our groups, we empower them. We teach them computers, we teach them sewing, we teach them cooking, we teach them all sorts of different things. So it's just so much easier then if they have a skill that they can go out. For instance, I have a nurse who comes and she teaches them how to look after the elderly. Then they can get a job as a carer and they'll earn a carer earns much more than a domestic worker. So we upskill them so that they can get better jobs and have a better life for themselves. I think women, especially in Africa, they've always put themselves down. 
you know, and, and women, I always say women are their own worst enemies because they're the ones who put themselves down. Nobody's really putting them down. They're allowing themselves to be put down. I work with an abused woman and she, said, she says, oh, my husband hit me. I said, no, he didn't. You allowed him to because if you didn't allow him to hit you, he wouldn't do that. And so um, I think we've just got to, um, I work with women to make them stronger. You know, men are strong. They get out there, you know, they put themselves out there, they'll do things. And that. But women, uh, by virtue of the way we were brought up, as little girls, we were taught to be nice and sweet and kind. We want everybody to like us. We want to fit in. We don't want to stand out. And I think that what I do is I teach women that it's okay to stand out. It's okay to put yourself out there. Not everybody's going to say you're fantastic. People are going to be very critical. But just if you think you're good. And you know, Oprah says, people said to her, you're so full of yourself. And she said, I'm so full and I'm overflowing. <laughs> and that's, I teach women to be overflowing, you know. Yeah. Amazing. And uh, what are the common mistakes you have seen businesses that probably started as small as you did keep making over and over and over again? Well, there are two things. First of all, they spend the, the turnover and think it's profit. You know, so you can't spend your turnover. You can only spend part of your profit. And I always say, out of every 100 rand that you earn, you've got to save 10 rand, you've got to invest 10 rand, and you've got to give 10 rand to charity. And then the rest you can use. But I think people just see that money and they go crazy and they spend it. And then what happens, people give you credit and you get into debt. And debt is a bottomless pit because with yeah. compound interest, you can never get out, you know. So I think that the, my biggest thing I always say to them, don't borrow, borrow, borrow. All you want to, and people will lend you, but what happens as soon as you start making money, you've got to pay them back and the interest. So you end up with no money, and then it's not a happy situation. So uh, don't borrow more than you can pay back right there and then. Oh, yeah. I think also, once they start to be successful, they want to go on holidays. They want to go overseas. They want to have weekends off. They want to, you know, they want to stop working. And people say to me, why do you still work? You work seven days a week, you know. And I say to me, because that's my business runs seven days a week. I've got to be there. I've got to lead from the front. If my staff see me sitting off, if I'm parked off on the beach and they see me on a summer holiday, they're going to want to be on holiday too. They're not going to want to work. And if they're at work, they won't work to full capacity. But if I'm there working with them on the floor on the pit face all the time then that then they think wow this is what we should be doing and that's what made our business get stronger and stronger you've been in this business for 40 years it's our 40th 40 years. year this year what lessons have you learned in this journey well so many but i think the first and most basic and most important lesson yes yeah, i think is you've got to look after your customers you've got to know your customer you've got to speak to your customer you've got to know that if your customer has a problem you can sort it out so we sell appliances so we sell fridges stoves washing machines televisions and um, that sort of thing and they, it's easy to sell them, but when it goes wrong, who does that person turn to? And I think that's why well, that's been our strength, that people know they can trust us, they can rely on us, that we will look after them and we will take care of their problems and we'll and yeah, basically just look after your customers. And what else? Yeah, you know, I think you've got to be very careful with your money. You've got to make sure you're investing your money back. You've got to um, co continue to grow. You know, technology is moving so fast. And I'm so lucky that we're in the electronics business, that we are taught all the time with, you know, the cell phones, artificial intelligence, and all the different things that are coming up all the time. We've got to be on top of it because we sell them. But I think you've got to keep up with technology, and you've got to ask yourself, how can technology work for me? You know, as I said to you, I teach people how their money can work for them. How can technology work for me? And I mean, there's so much, so many different things now. I've got call records. So I record all my phone calls. I've got something to do. I can just send that, press that call record button. It goes to my PA. She gets to take care of it. I think you've got to be fast as well. You know, the old days where you slow and you take your time. Today, it's a very fast-paced life. You've got to be very, very quick. And your common sense has to tell you, if you quick, you'll serve more customers than if you slow. If you serve more customers, you'll have money than if you don't. So, you know, I think it's been about fast on the ball, working long, working hard. And there's and also people look forward to their retirement. You know, the children being born today are going to live till they're 200. So if, today, if you reach the age of 50, you're going to live to over 100. So I think we've, we've got a long time to go. We must make the most of it. In terms of policies... What kind of policies would you say would encourage businesses to thrive more? And businesses managed by women as well. 
No, I think women are we're very hard workers. Uh, so I think with women businesses, their business always does well because they're very hard workers. They know that it's, it's a continuous thing. We've got to do the same thing over and over. I teach my staff over and over because we're a growing business. We keep employing more people. I teach them myself so we preserve the culture and I think culture is very important. The culture is, is, is how the business moves forward. It's what we do all the time and we do the same basics. We get the basics right and that's our strong foundation and that makes the business strong and keeps it going to the next generation. How do you manage to motivate your staff? Well, I think because I'm motivated, I'm driven, I'm, I'm motivated by other people's success. So if I can make them successful, you know, I take people and I bring them from, say, Durban, where I have head offices, to Johannesburg, and they come on a bus and they come with a, a supermarket packet with uh, two shirts and a pair of shoes in. And I say to them, within six months, you're going to buy a new car, and within five years, you'll buy your own home. And they say, oh, I'll never do that. And I say, watch this space. And then they do. And then their success... They actually do that. They actually do that. Mm. And their success motivates me to do it again and again because I see what joy they get from, from being able to be so proud. They've got a beautiful home, then they get a beautiful wife, and then they get beautiful children, and they can have all the things that they dreamt about having. But I showed them how to do it. And finally, 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 what advice would you give to entrepreneurs out there who, who are trying so hard to attain the position like you? Well, you know, I always say Rome wasn't built in a day. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, as children today, they taught for instant success, instant gratification. Nothing is instant anymore. It is continually doing the same thing over and over and building those steps. And what Dr. Stephen Covey teaches, he says, start with the end in mind. So where do you want to be? And when I go into the schools, I make them write essays for me, which says, so the essay starts, I'm 90 years old, sitting on my front porch looking back on my life. And they've got to go to 89, 88, 87, 80, and write their story backwards. Because once they've written it backwards, and the end of the story is it all finished today when Mrs. Hirsch spoke at my school, whatever the school is, and they were about 16 at the time. But when they've finished that essay, if they write it properly, they've actually plotted their life, and then they just have to take those steps to get to where they want to be. And then, for the young people out there, some people believe that they are not as serious as they should be. Do you think so? Well, I, I think the young people are very serious today. I really do. I think they are aware of what is expected of them. I think that they don't want to be like their parents. I didn't want to be like my parents. And the children today don't want to be like their parents. My children don't want to be anything like me. But I think <laughs> that they are driven to success because they, they see how important it is to be successful. And they will be successful in their own way. You know, so I think everybody's got, you know, I told you, God put the seed of greatness inside you. You've got to grow that. He, and your mission in life is to find your gift and your purpose in life is to give it away. And I think a lot of people are still finding their gift. And I really pray that nobody goes to their grave with the music still in them. They've got to find that music and play that music for the world. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>